OK Motion Club. And before we kick things off, honestly, we'd love to thank Dash Bash for having us and all of these amazing speakers. We're so honored to be a part of the lineup. Um, to get things started, we'd love to show you our show reel. Enjoy. <laughs> pretty new, um, but we are an animation studio that is woman-owned by the two of us, and we specialize in short-form social content. Um, we actually just got started this year, but we've been running an Instagram account since 2018, so it's not super new to us. <laughs> so a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm from Georgia, born and raised. I went to the University of Georgia. I graduated with a degree in printmaking, um, but to my surprise, there are not a ton of jobs in printmaking after you graduate. Um, so I actually ended up pursuing graphic design and then later falling into animation as a way to kind of bring my designs to life. Um, but because of printmaking, I still really love like tactile textures and layering elements and honestly just love nerding out over meticulous process. <laughs> Um, and then before OK Motion Club, I worked for about five years at an advertising agency. Um, I was a designer and then animator, and then eventually a design director there where I helped push design and animation forward. And as you can see, this is some of the stuff that I've worked on. Uh, and I'm Linda. I'm originally from the Boston area, and then I moved south to study at SCAD. Um, I studied in SCAD Savannah and then moved to Atlanta after graduating. Um, I got an internship that kind of focused more on motion graphics. Well, I went to SCAD for graphic design and then moved into motion graphics after graduating. Um, my style is I really like bright colors and like 90s nostalgia. Um, I'm like a Nickelodeon kid, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a number of reasons of why we wanted to start a studio and go off on our own, but you know, I think when we sat down to really think about why this was so important to us, and what can we change about the animation community in Atlanta um, were these three goals that we came up with. So first and foremost, make work that we're proud of. I mean, this seems obvious, but we both worked full-time gigs for a long time, and, and we did do great work there, but like any job, you become complacent or stagnant, and you kind of stop growing or pushing yourself, and that's why we started OK Motion Club in the first place. It was a way to foster creativity and, and push each other outside of our jobs. So that's something that is crucial that we continue to do as we grow this company. Uh, another one of our goals is to empower women and women identifying people in the industry. Um, we noticed a lack of women in the industry, especially in Atlanta. So, and we also understand the struggle of getting your voice heard in a male-dominated field. So we try to make ourselves available to give advice for people that are up and coming and like make an example of what you can achieve. Yep. Um, another one of our goals is to create a safe community space. Um, this is how you produce your best work. Um, we currently don't have a studio space, but we use our Instagram as a way to connect with other creatives. Um, this is like super important just because we understand that a lot of companies and work culture can be super toxic, so having an ally is super important. Yeah, exactly. 
So uh, before we get into more of our backstory and like how we actually started a studio, um, we wanted to kind of show you just some of our most recent works. And honestly, some of these are the most fun to work on because a lot of what we do, it literally is the two of us. We do the art direction, the storyboarding, design, animation, everything. So these projects are just total creative freedom for us. So the first one would be State Bicycle Co. Um, they are actually a bicycle manufacturer, but they do this really fun YouTube blog series where they follow these professional cyclists as they tell some crazy story that happened to them while they were biking. Um, and the short story that we got to animate to was with the cyclist Alex Howes, uh, and he tells a interesting story about how he accidentally rides off a cliff. <laughs> What's the worst crash you've had? I did have one in uh, the Basque Country where I was like a minute and a half back from the front group and it was a wet downhill and I was like, crashing's not for me, I'm gonna close this gap. And I was just like hooning down this thing and I was almost there. I was following this guy on a moto and I overshot this corner and I was like off cliff, gone. Right, and I like I just closed my eyes and curled up. And then like a bunch of this stuff went on and I like opened my eyes and I was like, son of a bitch, I'm in a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm like up there, and I'm like, oh my god, what do I do? Like, what do I do? And I'm like, okay, we're still racing. Like, okay, get out of the tree. You're fine. You're fine. Your bike? Well, that was the thing. I had to like, climb down on the tree, and then like go like way down this hill, and then like find my bike and come back up. And I came back up, and the guy who was driving the moto was just like literally doing this thing, <laughs> like, oh, oh. <laughs> he's, he's like looking at me and checking me, you know, and like I could tell he like was calling the ambulance. I'm like, no man, I'm good. Go to Bien. Like. <laughs> like, it's all good. Did and, your bike mess up? Uh, bike was fine. Being a little bit of blood, but... Okay. Until... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next project was with Crystal, yes, the fast food company. They sent us a brief to make content for 420. <laughs> um, and honestly, it was like, make craveable content for what you would like to watch when you're high. Uh, sounds like a dream brief. Um, basically, the animations just had to be contained within this like television that we helped composite. And it's just meant to be like you're kind of flipping through channels and seeing really weird stuff. Uh, so I did a supercut of just the four that we worked on together, but we did work with a team of animators. So highly recommend you go to our website sometime and watch the full length version. Highly. Highly. <laughs> side projects, uh, it's, we did a risograph animated poster. Um, so Amanda and I both have a background in printmaking, so we wanted to try to figure out a way to tie that in with animation. Um, and I've seen a few artists do this before, where you take a risograph print and then scan it into the computer and put it all together. Um, basically, you make the animation, deconstruct it, and then put it all back together. Yeah. Super time consuming process, yeah. <laughs> but you'll find that it's worth it. Um, so a little bit of process of how this works. So step one, this was my reference animation. Um, we determined our poster would have 35 frames laid out in a grid. So this animation has exactly 35 frames that we could break out. 
Um, and if you're not familiar with printmaking or a risograph, you have to print each of the colors layer by layer. So you have to break out the animation into each of the colors and then sequence those frames. So this is the black layer, the blue layer, and the pink layer. Next, you have to find yourself a Rizzo machine, which is a little difficult because they're obsolete now. Um, thankfully, we have a friend in Atlanta who has one. Coincidentally, it's called the OK Machine, <laughs> so we had to use it. Um, next, you'll create a master page, which is just the key layer that you scan into the printer. It reads all those gradients, and that's how you get different tones. Load your ink drum, print the first layer, print the second layer, however many more you do after that, and this is how it comes out yeah. when you scan it all back in. So you get all these like beautiful textures that are hard to replicate in the computer and, it, and like you get these happy accidents too where it's kind of offset, creates another white line in there. Yeah, um, this is my poster and this one was actually a mess up. The blue ink smeared but just kind of wanted to show like how beautiful even the mistakes can look. And this is why risograph is becoming popular again, is because you can't really recreate some of these textures and qualities through uh, programs. So now you know <laughs> where we are now, um, but we'd love to show you how it all began. Um, and we created a little timeline of our journey, so bear with us. <laughs> Uh, so in 2014, I worked at an agency with Amanda's boyfriend, who is now her husband, um, and I was the animator there, and he was the designer. Um, so that's where that's one of our photos that are, <laughs> it's more recent, but we don't have any photos from back then. Just so. Didn't document <laughs> us in 2014, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so 2016 to 2018, we both are just working full-time gigs. Um, I was at an agency. Lindo was in-house and she was already an animator. I was just kind of digging into it um, around this time frame. She was actually a huge source of inspiration for me. I knew that she was mostly self-taught, and I figured if she's able to be this good at it, then this is something that I can work towards uh, in my free time as well and figure it out. So November the 15th of 2018, we see an Instagram post that started it all. Um, and we'd actually like to show you the message exchange between us to honestly just let you know how easy it is that you can start something and unknowingly change your whole career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the post on the left. Um, if any of you follow Panimation, it's a women identifying and non-binary um, collective, and you should definitely follow them if you're not. But they did a takeover with Get It Girl Collective, and these ladies look awesome. Um, they all do amazing work together, and I think Linda and I had the exact same thought. I sent her the post and I said, I feel like we could do something like this in Atlanta. I, I was thinking the same thing. I'd be down to start something. <laughs> I would be too. Those women are all badass animators. It's cool that they started something like that. We should get coffee soon and figure out what we could do that's similar for Atlanta. I also don't know many other female animators in this city. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we work very close to one another. I'm so down to get coffee or lunch sometime. <laughs> and that was it. Um, we ended up getting drinks, and I think we, you know, we didn't have a name or anything. We just knew in that moment, we're like, we're gonna start a collective. We want to push female animation forward in Atlanta. And the thought of this becoming a career was like the furthest thing from our mind. We were like, I just want to make really cool work together. Yeah. I don't really, I wasn't about the money or anything. I'm bored at my full-time job. I need yeah. to do something fun. <laughs> so Christmas day of that year, I am out of town and I'm in the car and I just, the idea of the, of the name just pops in my head. And I text Linda, do you think OK Motion Club is a cool name? <laughs> <laughs> and we know it's a little self-deprecating, uh, but it just fit our sarcastic personality so well, and honestly, it's just kind of stuck. Uh, so my response was, yes, definitely. Um, and then we hit the ground running, um, creating our first Instagram post. So this was the th first thing that we ever posted, and we thought, we thought it would be really funny to do an OK hand <laughs> that says the word OK, and then we soon learned that the alt-right 
overtook the OK symbol. And we yeah, kind so of, we don't use this anymore. We kind of stopped <laughs> using it after that. Uh, but moment in history. Yeah. <laughs> um, so from 2019 to 2020, we're just really focusing on building our brand. We uh, did a lot of talks and events this uh, time period. So we uh, did a screen projection show. We um, we also, oh, we did the, these visuals for like a nightclub. a nightclub. And then we also just like hosted some talks and workshops and stuff. So, you know, we didn't really mind that we were working after hours, you know, pulling sometimes long nights just to like make these silly Instagram posts. But we felt like we were doing something important. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the best ways that we were able to start building our brand was through artist collaborations. And these were some of the, uh, artists that we collabed with, we, you know, honestly would just send DMs to people that we admired. And we felt like their styles matched up with ours. So to our surprise, most of them said, yeah, like, you can animate our stuff. Yeah. Although I, I don't know why we were surprised, because we were offering <laughs> free work to them. Um, but it worked out really well. Uh, I think it benefited both of us, and it, it got our name out in a, in a way that we could have never done on our own. Uh, so 2020 hit, um, not much happened that year, uh, <laughs> and um, honestly, like, it was just a ton of emotions, and it started to reflect in our work. Um, so we try to stay pretty positive on the, on our Instagram, but, like, we, like, mental health <laughs> is, is also part of it, and we want to be transparent that... When it sucks, it sucks. When it sucks, it sucks, yeah. <laughs> Um, and around this time, we hosted a talk with Moda in Atlanta. Um, and this was also around the time we were like, hey, maybe this could actually be a company or something. Yeah, it started to feel kind of real around this time. So from October to January of this year, this is like the four month span that we really are just like having an identity crisis, <laughs> hitting some serious walls at our jobs. And I don't know if we said this at one point or another or multiple points to each other, but we were like, I don't know what I wanna do next or where to go, but like I, I can't be here anymore. Um, and it's easy to kind of complain about a, a job and then maybe sit back and not do anything about it. But this time felt so different. We, we knew that we had to change and we felt like our talents were being wasted where we were, and we're not getting any younger. Uh, so in January, we had our first paid client, uh, which is Task Force. Um, and Task Force is a PR agency that creates social content around cultural injustice. Um, they actually found us through our Instagram, and they really liked our style. Um, and they've been awesome to work with because they basically give us a prompt and let us roll with it. Mm -hmm. So February of this year, we meet up for coffee, kind of a regular meetup. We kind of, once again, talk yeah. about leaving our jobs, <laughs> uh, maybe going freelance. And then the idea pops in our head, what if we started our own studio? Is that something we could do? Um, so the idea festers for a while, and then in March, we're like, are we actually doing this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're going to do this. Uh, if we don't see this through, then I think we're going to regret it forever, or someone else is going to do it before us. Um, so we give ourselves a deadline to launch the studio in the summer. But wait. <laughs> How do you start a studio? Well, we need a website. We need a reel. We should probably update our branding. LLC or S Corp? I think we need to call our tax guy. We should make merch. Do we really need business cards? I guess we should start using LinkedIn. <laughs> How do we pay ourselves? What's an operating agreement? I think we need to call our tax guy again. <laughs> uh, you'll feel like a criminal a lot, um, like you're doing everything wrong, but there's so many thoughts, and it can be overwhelming, but just take it one thing at a time and reach out to people who've done it before and can help you through it. An amazing tax guy yeah. is the first, is the yeah. great place to start. Um, so we do all those things, and we build a, a reel and a site, and we get some cool promo photos made. And in May of this year, we quit our full-time jobs. Yay! <laughs> um, <laughs> This is 
these are our reactions after we quit. I, I messaged Amanda and she called me and then we got drinks and it was the best feeling ever. Yep. <laughs> we're like, we're doing this. And then we still had to yeah, spend two more weeks at those jobs. But uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, in June of this year, we officially launch as a full-time studio. This is us. Yes. Yeah. And the only we way. <laughs> we, I mean. <laughs> We have matching jumpsuits, so of course we had it to, to start. It's the only way to look official, matching yeah. jumpsuits. Yeah. Um, so what happens next? I mean, hopefully you're getting tons of exciting work and you're on your way to a successful business, but we don't go through a lot of this without facing many of the same struggles you do, and for us, it's imposter syndrome. Um, many of you know that imposter syndrome is doubting your abilities, thinking you're a fraud at what you do, and having a hard time accept accepting any successes or accomplishments that you might get. And I thought I would do a little bit of research outside of what I already knew or my own experience just to see, like, wh like why is this happening so much, especially for creatives? What I found was a little troubling, but you'll understand why. Um, the term was originally coined as imposter phenomenon by two psychologists, um, actually from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, they did a study with 150 people, and they actually discovered that imposter syndrome disproportionately affects women. And not just any women, but high achieving, successful women. So I was like, of course, if you become a successful woman, you overcome all of these struggles to get to where you are. And if someone doesn't put you down for that already, you do it to yourself anyways, because it's so ingrained in your mind that you can't be as successful uh, in a traditional corporate environment as a man can. And I had to think, this experience has to be worse for creatives as well, because art is so subjective. Everyone has varying opinions on what's good and what isn't, and it's hard to know where you stand in that, and that can make uh, feeling like an imposter even worse. So 60% of these women um, experienced imposter syndrome during key moments in their career. So uh, that would be like a promotion or a job change or speaking at a conference. <laughs> um, but those moments can like make or break your career if you succumb to feeling like an imposter. And then half of those women said that those feelings of self-doubt resulted from never feeling like they were going to amount to such a success in the first place, which is so disheartening. Um, and I think that that one really hit home with me because I kind of always told myself that I didn't think I could be a leader or just wasn't really interested in one. It's not my personality. I'm more of an introvert. <laughs> but... I think I, after doing this research, I felt like I told myself that because I felt like I couldn't actually be one. Um, I'm fairly soft-spoken, small-statured woman that I just kind of thought people wouldn't respect me or take me seriously for who I was. Um, and it's so much easier to just kind of chalk it up to your personality rather than admitting the real problem is probably coming from the environment that is fostering those feelings to begin with. So I've had plenty of experiences with imposter syndrome. Uh, I feel like every project we get, you're like, is this going to be the one that they realize I'm a fraud? <laughs> this is they uh, no. But there were two main times in my career that were the biggest moments for me. And the first would be when I became a manager for the first time. I was so used to just owning my own work and just being concerned about my own job. And suddenly, I had six people under me that I was responsible for their careers. And I, I knew I had good rapport with them, we worked great together, but I couldn't help but think, like, I'm gonna fail at this. <laughs> um, and I think that pressure of being responsible for their careers just almost broke me. In a way, it kind of did, because it led to my second big moment of imposter syndrome, was when I chose to leave that job to start an animation studio with Linda. Um, we both knew that we were good at what we do, and we had a great response from our community, um, and really no reason to doubt that we couldn't succeed in this. But we still couldn't help but question, like, do we know what we're doing? Can we do this? 
Um, and the answer is yes, you can, we can, and it's that fear and anxiety that comes with imposter syndrome. That is the reason why there are so few women-owned animation studios today. So whenever we have feelings of self-doubt, um, I like to tell myself, the reality is nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> We're all just figuring it out. We're all learning something new. Um, and that's okay. And it's, don't feel like if you're uncomfortable or feeling anxious in those moments, that that makes you an imposter. It's important to remember that don't let those moments of anxiety turn into imposter syndrome, which in turn could prevent you from doing amazing work or becoming successful. So how do you overcome it? Um, I can't just stand up here and tell you not to be anxious because uh, we're <laughs> anxious, anxious right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a natural feeling. Um, but honestly, one of the best ways to get over imposter syndrome is to normalize that feeling. Talk about it. Reassure yourself and other people that everyone goes through this um, and you're not alone in it. Next would be confidence does not equal competence. If someone is more comfortable than you or they are louder than you, it does not mean that they know more than you. Fix the system, not the people. It, it makes you feel like you're the problem and you're the one that needs to be fixed, when in reality, it's probably the environment you're in. If it's not diverse enough, racially, ethnically, gender, it's not going to be a supportive, healthy environment for you to succeed in, so you should consider changing it. Positive affirmations, and this is not just to your peers, it's also to yourself. If you talk negatively to yourself, you're probably gonna start believing it, and it's not gonna help you move forward. Um, and this is also, if you see someone experiencing imposter syndrome, and you've been there before, uh, just tell them they're doing a great job, or like share their work online and show it off to people. It's little gestures like that that go a long way. Oops. And then lastly, give yourself credit. Um, obviously only if it's due. Don't steal someone else's credit. <laughs> but women are especially known for attributing their success to teammates um, rather than taking the credit if they actually did it. Or they'll say that it was just good luck. Like I just have to be in the right place at the right time. If you did it, say that you did it. And if you notice someone on your team that did not get recognition that they deserve, speak up for them because there might be some people that feel uncomfortable or are not able to speak up for themselves. And with that, I will hand it over to Linda. <laughs> We're running a little over. Um, there's like a timer right here and it makes me super anxious. <laughs> and I feel like Mac's gonna come out with an air horn when it goes up. <laughs> um, so now that you have your so self-doubt under control, how do you get paid fairly? Uh, well, this kind of ties back to the, to the conversation about imposter syndrome, but know your worth. Uh, when you know your worth, you know what to ask for. Uh, but how are you supposed to know your worth? You can start by just counting the years of experience you have, and it really doesn't matter what position you are in. Um, your years in the industry speak volume for just understanding workflow, processes, timelines, and budgets. Um, you have to educate the client about your skill set sometimes. Um, not everyone is going to understand your background and what you bring to the table. Like, for example, sometimes we get reached out to, to do 3D animation, and that's just not something we've focused a lot of time on. So we'll respond with a little bit more detail about our style and what we can do. And you'll be surprised because sometimes they just don't know what to ask for and they still want to work with you. Um, educating the client also applies to budget. So if you're being asked to, to work for a lower rate, tell them. Um, if the budget is low though, and it's something you're really passionate about, consider what you're gaining from the project. That's not strictly money. Like it could be more creative freedom, a cool portfolio piece, um, or just like getting your foot in the door with a creative team. Uh, and this is something I struggle with a lot, um, <laughs> the fear of saying no. Uh, it comes from a few different sources, like not sure of when your next project will come in, or you don't want to let somebody down. But when you say no to a project, it shows that you understand boundaries and what you can and can't do. 
Um, plus, saying no is way better than saying yes and then potentially under-delivering on a project. Uh, so, uh, the gender pay gap, <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> um, and here are some tips for how to help with it. Uh, so, transparency is awesome. Uh, you could share your salary or a salary range. Um, the only way people, that, people know that they're being paid unfairly is if there is transparency. And get comfortable talking about money. This also goes back to the conversation of transparency, but like, um, if you're comfortable talking about the work, you gotta be comfortable talking about the money that's involved in it. And speak up. Speak up for the people that constantly have to speak up for themselves. Uh, we all know what the issues are, yet it's people that are directly affected by them that usually have to speak up. And get involved in the communities. Um, so get involved in communities that are doing great things for minorities in our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, locally, we have one called Ease ATL, um, and then we mentioned Panimation earlier. But also, if there's not a community that you're aware of, look into starting one. Like, talk to literally anybody here and just get involved and make cool shit together. <laughs> <laughs> um, lastly, we wanted to share some parting advice. Um, you know, whatever you choose to do with your career, whether you are deciding to go freelance or you are trying to land a big gig or start your own studio, um, this is some of the things that have helped us get us to where we are. So turning your self-doubt and fear into positive motivation. Don't let imposter syndrome prevent you from being successful. Use it as fuel to make you want to do better work and just do amazing things. Know your worth. Uh, you are bringing value to each project you are on and make sure you are getting paid fairly for it. Patience and perseverance. And you have to have patience to kind of understand that it, it takes a while to gain a reputation. You know, it doesn't happen overnight, or at least for most people. You know, we've been working at this for over two years now, and um, yeah, you kind of just have to put yourself out there. Not all, everyone is going to come to you, and that can make you feel a little uncomfortable, but you should, you should know that you have great work and people probably want to see it. And find your community. Um, this is so, so important to have a strong support system that can vouch for your work. And lastly, have as much fun as you can, <laughs> because if it's not fun, then like, why are you doing it? There's so many jobs we could do that probably don't require us to be hunched over at our desk and like in pain. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, we're so passionate about this career, so put out work that you enjoy doing, because if you don't enjoy it, then people are probably gonna keep coming back to you for the work that you don't like. So yeah. have fun. <laughs> And that's our talk. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you.